Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Sundance's National Poetry Month reading series. This is the third installment of our 22nd year of the series. And while we wish that we could all be together in the store, we're happy that you've joined, you've all joined us once again here on the internet. Today, we will be hearing from Jesse DeLong, Jason McCall, and Peter Streckfuss. I'd like to momentarily highlight Jesse DeLong's new collection, The Amateur Scientist's Notebook, which was recently published by Baobab Press and is available at the store now. Baobab is the publishing arm of Sundance and we're all very excited for you to hear what Jesse has written. And we're just as excited to hear from Jason and Peter who I believe will be making their Sundance debut today. Now here once again is our Poetry Month host, Sean Griffin. Thank you, Emily, and welcome to everybody out in uh, the ether sphere, and welcome to our guests from uh, the east and, and uh, south coast. I so appreciate you joining us here. It's going to be a great day. Before I begin, I want to read a poem from Laura Weatherington, who uh, is living in the Netherlands at this time and who would be reading in this series, so uh, from her new book, but needless to say, it's a long way away, so I'm going to read one poem. This poem was entitled, The Spring, in fact, is freezing after Deborah Heisler. One ground in front of the other, space naming each thing, its baby walk, the measure of spring. And the sight that carries the thin, cool air of the morning in through the window, the sun's coming up over the desert. Now the eyes age and drinking, from lenticular clouds. The dream is my evidence, cleaving the valley, the numbers, of course, of birds. Morning voice is a whisper, just like that, over. And particularly on the first day of spring, the roofs remain frosted. Again, that's Laura Weatherington from her new collection. Well, welcome everybody, it's great to see you. We have three wonderful poets today. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna to briefly introduce each of them. Uh, we'll read, uh, they will read, and then there should be a few moments for questions if you have them at the end, and you can put them on the YouTube site. Um, so Jason McCall is gonna start. Um, his, day, his, um, his book, he has two books of poetry out, uh, Two-Faced God and Dear Hero, winner of the 2012 Marsh Hawk Poetry Prize, and also two chapbooks. He's a native of Montgomery, and he teaches at the University of North Alabama. Let's give a warm welcome to Jason McCall. Thank you. Um, again, thank you to Sundance Books. Thank you to all of the organizers. Um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this reading. And I'm really excited to be part of this. Um, really excited to celebrate Jesse's book um, during National Poetry Month. Um, I mentioned it a little bit during the intro, uh, but today is a really good day for me because uh, 10 years ago today, actually, um, April 15th, 2011, I got the phone call that my first book was going to be picked up for publication. So uh, this is a fun anniversary date for me, and it kind of brings some things full circle. So this is always a little celebration day on my calendar, even though it's normally tax day. Um, but it's a day to celebrate poetry, and it's a day to celebrate uh, poetry communities. Um, you know, I met Jesse at the University of Alabama when I was working there. Um, and so it's fun to see how kind of literary communities, creative communities can carry on. And it's fun to see those successes that we can see. Um, one of the things I always say as a poet, as a literary citizen, as a teacher, as a friend, I always like to say, kind of, I love seeing my team win. Um, and obviously as a sports fan, I love seeing my team win. But when it comes down to, to seeing friends be successful, seeing colleagues be successful, um, I'm always a really a big fan of that. So today, this is kind of more, for me, the, the really exciting part is to really celebrate books. Um, I'm going to read, for me, this is the least exciting part because I know what my poems say. Um, but and I'm actually going to read from my newest chat book um, called, Two, called A Man Ain't Nothing. Now, this was published by Pork Belly Press. 
And A Man Ain't Nothing is a chapbook that's centered around the legend of John Henry. Um, and as we talk through the computer right now, John Henry kind of becomes a really interesting story because it's an old story about man versus machine, um, where the, the classic story says John Henry had to race against the steam drill to prove that men could compete against machines. And of course, he wins the race, but he loses his life. Um, and at least for the last year or so, as a lot of us have had to figure out how to retool our life, retool our workspace around technology, um, it's felt like maybe we've been fighting the machine as well. But the John Henry story is also a story about music. It's also a story about race. It's also a story about masculinity. Um, and it's also a story about kind of America and our relationship to work and value. Um, and so this is a small book, but I've tried to pack a lot of big ideas in here. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems to lead off. And um, I'll start with the first poem. Again, this, is, this book is centered around John Henry, but every poem isn't a John Henry poem, um, which is always the trick when you ask a writer what their book's about. They'll tell you what it's about, but then, of course, once they start to talk about it, it's not about that at all. It's much bigger. Because I watch too much HGTV like everybody else, uh, the title of this first poem is Watching Fixer Upper on Columbus Day. Change can be a bullet or a ballot initiative raising taxes for the breakaway school district, outbreaks or broken leases. Any talk of death is too much Old Testament. Lose the salt pillar and locust. This is revival rehab, transitioning, flipping the page from a bloody body to the gates of a walkable community. Don't think of it as a shift in color or coin. Think of the buyers, and the modern buyers don't love anything more than gray. We love gray because gray is neutral. Gray is blameless. Gray can be anything from a mishap at sea to a language barrier, to an economic force, to an alien pathogen, to a trigger that slipped and kept slipping until no one could help but notice the blood and what blood does to the marketplace. We can tell any story with gray and a choice splash of color. Gray speaks our language. Gray attracts the neighbors we want to show the next generation of buyers when it's time to move on to a new investment opportunity because there's just so much to gain when we take someone else's walls and knock them down. Look at how big it feels. Just look at what can happen when we open this place up. Again, I know I'm part of the problem, and I know I'll probably end up watching House Hunters at the end of the night tonight. Um, I mentioned before, John Henry also um, kind of becomes a kind of pop culture figure in a lot of way. Um, the John Henry song, in a lot of ways, is called one of the most researched songs of all time, uh, because a lot of people have tried to track down the tradition of the song so that they could track down the real, true John Henry. Um, and of course, the John Henry song comes from a work tradition and in a lot of ways, American work songs uh, ended up being some of the foundation, of course, that our work songs, plantation songs, gospel songs become the foundation of Southern music, which become the foundation of blues music, which become the foundation of, in a lot of ways, American music in a lot of ways. And so tracing John Henry through different elements of pop culture, whether it's music, media, et cetera, um, incidents of work and workplaces. So this has a movie reference in it. Uh, the title of this poem is we want some brothers up on the wall. And that's taken from the Spike Lee uh, movie, Do the Right Thing. There's the famous argument in the pizza joint about why there are no black people on the wall. We want some brothers up on the wall. A black man's job should never make him think about Spike Lee movies. So I won't go to the next staff meeting and joke about there being no brothers on the wall in any of the office posters. Besides, there's only one other brother in the office and a couple of sisters. And if they missed out on the joke, this job would be lonelier than it is. I know I should be better than counting the number of black faces in every room I walk into, but I'm still a slave to the mathematical proof of one black face plus one black face 
equals infinity or zero black faces because America doesn't know the difference between two black faces or an armada of black faces. America only knows a black face means that it's time to fire off a question about basketball or Black Panther. If there were more brothers on the wall and more brothers and sisters in the hall, then maybe I wouldn't leave my door closed so much. But maybe I would close it more because I don't know how to love a black face because I never wanted to see my own face as anything more than a rental that wasn't likely to make it past its warranty. I'm only playing a role. I'm Mookie. I'm Raheem. I'm the mayor. I'm the heat making the world squirm and scowl and hate God for making me. I'll do this next one. Um, there's a musical reference here. I mentioned I mentioned music. Um, also, um, in this reference, there's a reference in this poem. Uh, the title of this poem is For the 95 Bodies Found on the Imperial Sugar Plantation. Um, if John Henry did exist, John Henry was probably part of the convict leasing system um, that was a riot spread prison labor, prison exploitation system throughout a good part of the southeastern United States. Um, and in a lot of ways, it was a transition from a slave economy to a prison labor economy. Um, obviously, today we still hear issues about for profit prisons, we still hear issues of prison labor. Um, in a lot of cases, we hear about the tradition of the quote unquote chain gangs. Um, and so if John Henry did exist, he was probably part of a forced labor camp, a prison labor camp. Um, this, these 95 bodies found on the Imperial Sugar Plantation were actually found when an old sugar plantation in Texas was going to be retrofitted into a school. And so when they started to do the surveying work, they found these bodies. Um, and in a lot of cases, when they do survey work around a lot of these bodies that were prison plantation sites, work sites, mass graves aren't unlikely to be found. They're found a lot more often than they should be. For the 95 bodies found on the Imperial Sugar Plantation, even the machines miss the bodies on their first scans because machines can play chess, play the piano, play the market, but they can't learn to lie like a magician never learned how to make a body vanish and make the crowd applaud the departure of that body name, footsteps that told the family that body was walking through the front door in time for dinner. The plantation will turn into a school. Torture becomes teachable moments. Lead belly becomes CCR. But every good trick desires an illusion. So our wide eyes will swear they see the ghost of the accountant's assistant smiling while she watches a little black girl sweat over a calculus midterm. We will swear there's a ghost in the locker room watching little black boys of all colors, chalk, cream, and coffee black trade dick jokes before practice. We will swear there's a chorus of ghost hands clapping at graduation while the valedictorian gives a speech about the work ethic she learns from her father by watching him rise up from the dead of night and go work two jobs. We'll swear we saw those ghosts smile one last time before they bathed themselves in the leafy soaked light of oblivion. But those ghosts know every trick the country has ever played. Those ghosts aren't in any hurry to leave. They need to know why we left them on this plantation when we could have imagined them anywhere else. They need to know why we keep talking about work when there are 95 funeral songs that need singing. They need to know what else are we willing to share after sharing an article or a solidarity emoji. And they need to know if Viola Davis or Octavia Spencer will play the one black woman forgotten in these 95 boxes of black bones and they need to know how we believe in 95 ghosts being only 95 ghosts. And they need to know how we ever learned to walk in a country where every sidewalk is a lost graveyard. They need to know how we ever managed to turn something so rotten into something so sweet. And there's a lead belly reference in that poem. Um, and from what there's a, again, it might be apocryphal, 
but the story is that Layette Belly's version of the song Midnight Special, I mean, that's a famous blues song, uh, song about Layette Belly, Little Richard, um, CCR takes it up. Um, and the story is that the Midnight Special is a train, and if the lights of the train shine in your cell, then maybe somebody's coming to get you. And the story is that Layette Belly's version of that song was actually inspired by his time on the sugar plantation um, during his time as a prisoner. I'm gonna read a few more. Um, there are actually a couple of poems that do mention John Henry, so here we go. Um, I promise this isn't a setup, John Henry does show up. I need John Henry. I don't need John Henry with John Legend and Common in the background. I don't need John Henry for one week in February. I don't need John Henry with a bootstrap epilogue. I don't need John Henry pretending to be Superman. I need John Henry sweating hard as Patrick Ewan in overtime. I need John Henry with Nat on one shoulder and Phyllis on the other asking, you down to do this shit or what? I need John Henry leaving his hammer in the Alabama muck so it can grow into Brittany Howard's voice. I need John Henry at the gates of Black Valhalla checking to see whose hands are dirty enough to get in. And again, that becomes kind of a list poem, but I was really happy that I could get Patrick Ewing in a poem and Brittany Howard in a poem at the same time. Uh, Brittany Howard, great Alabama musician, and Patrick Ewing, New York Knicks, great player. Um, the last time I really cared about a basketball team was those 1990s New York teams that could never quite beat the Chicago Bulls. Um, I'll read, just wanna make sure I'm good on time. I'll read one more. Um, and again, thank you all for letting me be part of this reading. Thank you to Sundance Books. Thank you to all of the organizers. Thank you to Peter and Jesse for reading with me tonight. The last title of this, the last poem is titled, I'm Glad John Henry Died. Because nobody will ever love me enough to believe my ghost will save them from the dark mouth of the earth. Because I never learned how to sing at my own funeral because I can't make the world dance and shake with the beat of a 20 pound hammer, because my body never helped anyone invent the blues that invented all the hustler anthems, because I can't kill myself and get y'all to thank me for it. But mostly I'm jealous because he made it to the heart of something. Even if that heart was black, even if that heart pumped poison into his mouth, even if that heart was dead since the earth was born, it was a heart, and I don't have one memory of touching a heart or a heart touching me or someone reaching for my heart, even if they were reaching to break through my ribs and squeeze my heart into pus and blood. Zeno says nothing ever really reaches its destination, but a man reached the moon and John Henry reached 14 feet and the drill only reached nine. And I'm jealous of John Henry's dead body because he might not have lived but he did die and I know how to love a dead body. When I see John Henry in the tomb of Kusa or Lewis with death in his lungs and poetry running up his veins, I see Hades. I know, I know, the myths about black death never end without mentioning a white God. But when I see John in that mountain, black as in the underworld, I see Orpheus inching toward the light with his love one step behind, and I finally stop hating the god of death for pulling Eurydice back into the earth because I'm learning that a dead body is hard to give up. Ask me why I scream B.I.G.'s verse on Mo Money, Mo Problems every time the sun looks to pull the earth out of its deathbed. Ask me why this is as close as I can get to understanding the Holy Spirit claiming somebody's tongue. Ask me why every black song is a dirge. Ask me why I'm smiling, and I will tell you the story of all the men who died for me but didn't stay dead. Thank you. Wow. That was something, Jason. Thank you. That was wonderful. Wow. I, I so appreciate the, the voices that are coming in on this long distance wire. You know, every week we get, we get tossed around in the, in the interweb and every week they're just so, so refreshing and uh, we need them so much right now. We're just living in a, in a silence that's um, 
you know, we haven't experienced before. So thank you very much, that was great. So our next reader is Peter Strachfus. He's the author of two poetry books, Hearings, winner of the Fordham University Press's 2013 PLO Editor's Prize, and The Cuckoo, which won the Yale Series of Younger Poets competition in 2003. <clears throat> Excuse me. He, he's on the faculty of uh, George Mason University's Creative Writing Program and the Low Residency MFA in Creative Writing at Cedar Crest College. And he co-directs uh, uh, Poetry Daily. Let's give a warm welcome to Peter. Thank you, Sean and Jason. Um, so nice to see you again um, and to hear those poems. Um, I think of all the men who have died. I, I think about um, Dante Wright, um, the man um, murdered by Minneapolis police um, just this week. Um, what you say about what blood does to the marketplace and how big this place is if we open it up. Um, and, and, how, um, and how work like yours opens it up. Um, and, and bringing people together like, um, like the reading that we're having here. Um, thanks, Sean, for your, your making this happen in Sundance Books. And Jesse, um, it's so nice to be here with you um, as um, um, someone who has read your poems for, for so long and, and, um, and to have this book. Um, in my hands is is really a, an amazing pleasure. Um, so I'm gonna read a, a few poems here. Um, the the first one that I'll read um, opens with a reference to some words um, by Henry James that um, that Edith Wharton um, repeats in an essay. Summer afternoon, summer afternoon, to me those have always been the two most beautiful words in the English language. And this poem is a sequence of, uh, I think, nine pieces, um, and I'll pause between each section. It's titled Holy Fire, Cleveland National Forest, California, 2018. The Pacific wears its thin veil of smoke. Summer afternoon repeated. In English, the most beautiful words. You, child, are in its simulacrum, a salt water pool by the townhouses. I see you through your eyes, their piercing catch of mind as you master the intake of breath above its reflection, water and the body of your little boat, nearly five years on the earth, the pool too deep for you to touch. For days later, I record it, like Wharton's repetition of James's, transcribed and altered against the impossibility. Impenetrable time, I record this here. Meanwhile, the Ferguson fire and the car and the Mendocino complex fire, the largest on record in California, 459,000 acres raged in the north. Meanwhile, the Holy Fire, named after Holy Jim Canyon, where it began when a man named Forrest gave it to his neighbors, flamed over the saddled crest of Saddleback on its way through its first 18,000 acres, visible from our pool 
12 miles away. And the air above Lake Elsinore rose each summer afternoon and drew wind from the Pacific. So the fire respired down canyon and sun, then up at night. The fires down up canyon movement each day named for the lake, the Elsinore effect. The lake itself named for Hamlet's house on fire, for everything may serve a lower as well as a higher use. The surface limbs and breaks across your goggles in summer afternoon. You break your stroke and raise your resolutely sealed lips above it, your lungs a sound that brings the bodies of disaster into view and all their clear abstraction. You come to me, you steal your breaths in memory, like a word, it pushes through the air. It comes to the ear, it cries out, cut from its mother. I am born. At the Embarcadero, we'd ridden the Ferris wheel. We'd had ice cream. We did not shop. We didn't have time. We played in the sand yard on the shore, a Gulliver-sized statue of a foot, a head, a knee, a hand, coming out of the sand. We did not ride the merry-go-round. We did not have time. We were leaving, walking back to the lot and your sister turned to run for a fountain. She followed you who just bolted for the fountain. And I grabbed her by the arm to keep her near, to keep her from being at the fountain. I held her by the arm, by the hand. I turned quickly to catch her, a kind of arrest. I kept her while you ran until I caught you to catch. What is it I want to say? I am not gentle. I was quick as her bolt was quick. I was fierce as if to say no, never as if to say, I catch you, have you in hand to defeat her flight. Is this what a father does? As if to say, do not try to escape again, not when you're within my reach. As if from the sky, as if from my half sleep, do not wake me in my confusion. You, keen on the souvenir in the market, with your song, and your cloud architects rising from their tables, pouring their structures in concrete. I spoke to your mother tonight after we put you and your sister to sleep. She said she hoped I could be happy soon. She wished me to be gentle with you. When you cry, hurt or enraged, the philtrum, the medial cleft of your upper lip stretches, transformed. I feel my esophagus like a scabbard tighten. How to remove the story without depending on force, how to reach you standing at the door, wanting nothing more from me in the room than the half-thought substance of my own attention. To be noticed, 
See me, Daddy. Daddy, look closely. I have a magic trick to show you. Anger comes so easily out of me, my author, father, since you died. By the time you were old, you seemed empty of it. You were a punisher, punitive strikes with the belt. I don't want to tell my son this. I don't know how often the welts on my legs were there. Were they normal to me? But I know they were no surprise. Seen as a sign that you had whipped me too hard. An apology. My mind fills and runs, nervous as I try to enter this room with you. As you strayed, from details of the punishments you suffered under your father. Daddy, watch this coin. Where did it exit the world? A school of koi in the shallow beneath a pier turn over one another, churning. One mini have a kind of pink wound on the back, circular, as if a sticker from a banana, as if a coin of their flesh had been removed. You were a punisher. You would abide little dissent. Now I am the punisher, time as the divisor. Without us, in its own undulating place and time, the blaze rises in the sky. It creates heat. Its heat creates its own wind, feeding it more oxygen, violence proceeding from it as if on command, as if automated. Round the world, a chain of supervision the hurt and pain of that. From the ridge, I watch its tent refracted through smoke in the distance, a robin's blood orange, a koi's, a dark safety cone, a train cuts through the valley, the hills terraced with those who can and cannot. In the veil, as if to meet the day's first aerial tanker, drop a sheet of retardant. It raises its volcanic head, the holy fire. Time as the divisor, your sister folds like a knife and her inflatable donut and teleports bottom first into the pool's deep end. You pull through the water, your slender hero's body, raise your head, gasp and thrash your nonce breaststroke further toward me. The next poem that I'm going to read um, is also written uh, addressing one of my kids. It's called An Allegory. And it's much shorter. In the froth of bubbles on the surface of your bath, I put to sea a starfish-shaped cup. In the cup 
was a figurine, its species unclear. It looked like a pig monkey floating in the shell of the boat amid the bubbles. Float, I said. Float, you said. You took the boat and pulled it under the bubbles toward yourself. You tried then to float it again, filled with water, but its inside and outside had become similar. It no longer existed as boat. It was in a state of fullness. I took the animal and the boat and floated them together. No, you said. You pulled the boat and animal back under and looked at me. Swim, you said. I'm going to read one more poem. And this poem comes from my second book, um, Airings. And um, it picks up, I, I, maybe it picks up some of the, the uh, motifs of these last two poems, um, although it was written earlier. Um, I wrote it. Um, after my, my father passed away. It's called The Lake and the Skiff. Tell me again about the lake of the poem, the little skiff in which you were curled like an infant in its bed the dark canopy of sky rattling above. Standing at your bedside, we recounted our tale to you. The regularity of our speech prevented the breezes being so discursive. You looked out through your eyes at us and blinked to show you heard. We said we'd little time before the city gates shut. This revealed to you the error and the doctrine that maintains among the numerous souls within us, one is more aflame. As we paddled away to speak and rest together, the wind took up its chorus, straightening your body. You said nothing. Lord Marpa, the translator said, sons, if you do fawa, do it like this. Then a sphere of five colored light, the size of an egg ascended into the sky from a crack at the crown of his head. Then we were left alone, like dwellings unconnected. Search, confused one, around your shores, if any parts of you rejoice in peace. The flight path of a bird in the sky the channel cut by a fish as it glides, the void of dreams. How difficult it is to remain one person. Thank you. Uh, Peter, thank you so much. That was, that was a, a lovely reading. I so appreciate the cadence with which you read and how you slowed the reading down so that we could be present with you at this time. My apologies for mispronouncing the title of your book. 
Um, but I thank you nice. for coming uh, to us from, from DC. It's great to imagine that we have someone coming to us from three different, people coming to us from three different states across this country. We've been doing this for 22 years and I keep saying we can't do it, we can't get any better. And every year I'm proved wrong. And uh, what you're hearing tonight is proof of that. We're gonna close with our, uh, our superstar tonight, Jesse DeLong's debut manuscript. He's gonna read from the Amateur Scientist Notebook. It's just published, as Emily said, from Baobab Press. Uh, like all of you, I'm thrilled to hear him. He has two chapbooks out. Uh, and he teaches at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. And let's give a warm welcome to Jesse. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Sundance Books, for hosting this event. And thanks, Sean, for putting it together. Thanks, Peter and Jason, for reading with me. And um, of course, thanks, everybody who tuned in. Uh, to start, I'm going to read the first poem from the book. It's called Florets. Uh, it's in four parts. One of the things the speaker is doing in this poem and he's doing in a lot of the other poems is he's continually interrupting himself. So the speaker will interrupt, interrupt himself and then sort of start again from where he was before um, after interrupting himself with these little embedded poems. So Florence, one. The struggle of scale begins in a sunflower. Floret, sharp of petals, stem bright, it starts to fill air, to feed earth, to forge from root to flower, the color and coarseness of its borders while around sprouts the collage of a larger order, feathers, flora. Bird, I light a lamp, wick submitted to kerosene, a horizon of dust furrows. Restless, I withhold any offerings as you settle into the sofa a sunflower plucked and lain on pink clovers. Phosphorus, water and light. A sunflower bound of small flowers blooming in the sun. What is one is once lost. Torn, once lost in one, empties into soil. Bird, you inherit such gestures. Sand releasing its shape to water. A cloud bruising in leaflets of rain into the toil of root fibers curling around a rib cage, minerals measuring the level of our difference, a chrysanthemum colored bee, a drone carriaging no spores, no stinger, no home. Light absorption on a leaf, simply split, the strewn can be supported by the order, feathers, flora. A lamp sprouts through the air, Slowly you rise. You're the bulb I was born to close my eyes to. I try to touch your arm, but you are already in the bathroom. In the mirror, I memorize you, massaging soap on your fingers. Or to say our ozone is one big lung full of air where particles of leaf, litter, and clay collide in the fringes of tissue. Two. Tissues of song, of sinew, wind, and root. Three, sallow as moth wings, I stare. Clouds rattle the sky like dust in a furnace. Nothing is perfect. I spent the morning sorting through every door you'd entered. Feeling powder fluttering in my chest, I step outside where you are reading High Boon under the house's shade and grass is muttering a language too green for glare. The chrysanthemums keep sunlight in little boxes on their petals. What is the contour taken in the brain when restlessness finally subsides? You set the book aside and sleep with a hat over your eyes. The sunflowers begin to napkin up the light, rice paper between my fingers. Vapors on soil Centers rough as wrist lines, I delicately rotate their bodies, careful not to tremble, wary even, even of my own breath. Four, for those sunflowers of May, clarity strikes everything a petal or stem displays, a revelation by route of pigmentation, 
or the scriptures of shade composed in vain on undergrowth, thousands of florins. I light a fire beside the river to crave the shade your face keeps, the sky tarnished in smoke, flames, and ash. When you grace the bank, lungs lit, water drumming, attuned blood nose, I announce the night, our God, no wind, no, the moment, no moment. So tiny, they squander intricacy on light cherished, smoldering, gold with transparency, canvassing petal centers in the borderlines of hunger. Everything the soil supports is foreseen in seed, the land laying out before summer like an exhalation, a single floret of smoke points onward. Floret as water. Crisp in the lungs, autumn then is a breath held. Stems begin to brittle, birds forage for seeds, coyote bones, white waste on the river's red bank. Broadcast lost in snow, we drive the interstate where time is suspended between long purple shadows and morning when the birds bleat, sleeping and the warmth of your breath gathers on glass. When I stir, you smile, staring to where fronds of headlights are guiding us home. The gap between pure white and pure black, the axis, our bodies rotate. When I turn, your eyes are closed. Scribbled in fog is the word, we. What is a bone bleached in river light if I am always restless and restless enough to scavenge? A chickadee sings somewhere in the snow-covered trees, its voice a whistle and whistles, e whistles echo, the moth dead on the windowsill for days. For those who tire to scrape throats through frost, Snow sloshes the lawn, pebbles, mud, and ice chunks. A sparrow docks on the fence post, ruffles water from wings. Ah, the sun again. I light near the snow globe you gifted me during a softer winter. The glass is chipped and eclipses a ring on the windowsill's dry wood. In stained fingers, sky mirrors on the crest of the globe, clouds swelled, the bird shadows its wings upside down in departure. Dusk in a tree, slowly, slowly. The sky, an ice-stilled atom where a brown bat screels, ultrasonic in the cooling air. I want to pronounce the distance, rattle the treble point where space and time collide, materials of lung and liver etched in this layer where one is one and once lost in one where one is once here and there, the imprint our bodies make on autumn and after. Past the globe, land emerges in chalk lines, a spine of hills narrowing to knuckles, ridges sharpened where the sky has lit its paper ends. If only our rituals really nourished us. Near the river dawn, I tender as if anything more, the coyote rib. Morning slates on pebbles, the current disassembles the sun. Road lights, the only sound in the room. The curtain could be the northern lights, the carpet, a tar pit. This is the void I willingly enter every day. I cross my arms, rest my hands at my shoulders, fingers spread, I take a step back, a step forward, a step back and to the side. Some ants march from a fallen tree to where an apple core browns on weeds. The hunger goes on and on like this, an animal knowing from which flares of love you feed. Um, the next poem I'm gonna read, when I was writing this book, I was appropriating some forms and working with other forms. And um, in this case, I was looking at scientific charts. This particular chart was occurrence of phosphorus in uh, plants and different fruits and vegetables. So um, I borrowed some of that language, used the form of the chart, and so it's in columns. So occurrence of phosphorus intermediates in florets. Where observed, potato tubers, oat seedlings, 
Intermediates, irises uprooted, train light digging up what lies ahead. Florence, reference of. My father cleft his hands into the soil. It was noon, 1975. He'd ridden on a train for four hours and walked a dirt road home, irises picketed along the ditch. The sun pressed a sack of oats on his shoulders. Wounded by his fingers, earth emitted the pheromones of a horse after its rider first settles into saddle. From the dirt, he removed a tuber and held it like he would the weight of his son's head. He placed the tuber in the center of his kitchen table beside a horsetail braid of irises. As he walked towards the barn, his path cleft through the clover field, bats in the rafters, sunlight sporing through the stable's slats, ox blood colored, hay dust solar as upcoming railings. From a burlap sack, he tendered oats in his palm and the horse cleft its lips into the seedlings, my father rubbing its neck, minutes later working dirt from a potato skin under the faucet. Where observed, grapes, legume seeds, intermediates, a nail arched from a long finger, florets, reference of. My mother walked into a carpet of clover, stems arching on her ankles like purring cats. She carried grapes in an egg white handkerchief and kneeled and set the bundle on a mat of flora, carefully stretching every corner so the handkerchief became a tablecloth and the grapes a feast. A ladybug lighted on a clover, its red body gemmed. Years earlier, while still young enough to ruby carelessly in sunlight, she ran, red earrings winged, beside a fence where grapes grew, rattling her fingers through the soft marbles of fruit. Hidden below a curtain of leaves, a nail split her thumb, the way in the clover patch she would puncture grape skins, a single drop of, bug, of blood ladybugged on a leaf. Where observed, sedum leaves, beets, spinach leaves, and petioles, intermediates, the pressure of nightfall, florets, reference of. In a meadow, my mother and old man, maybe not so old at this time, spread out a quilt and lay under the silk screen shade of clouds. Inside the woven basket, carried like a tackle box, were beets, charred coated in olive oil, garlic, and goat cheese. A large mason jar filled with water and a few cu cucumber slices for flavor. When they finished eating, he dumped his eyes like a pile of earth on her. Lying on her stomach, one leg raised, her toenails offered up the sky, and she stared at stone crop flowers draped under the weight of last night's light rain. Certain breeds' petioles could be mixed with kale to give the meal a taste of tea and old earth. Others could clutch lungs to rawhide, and I knew from what she'd admitted she carried both with her. When he was picking potatoes, she felt roots shuffling sand in her lungs, though some days when he left for the field, five flowering stone crop fingers sprouted, their stamens resting stations for later ladybugs. She always wanted to or always would be affected by a field of different colored florets. A giant raindrop of light spelunk through the trees irises and bluegrass and sedum leaves beaming, glass blown from a street lamp. Where observed, pea seedlings, tea leaves, intermediates, trout and vegetables in green broth, florets, reference of. In a porcelain bowl, a pile of pea pods lay like the bloated husks of mantises. Flex earthed the rim's gloss. My parents' fingers were smeared in dirt and they'd already filled several plastic bags full enough to balloon the linings. Through the kitchen window, 
sunlight on the kettle cast a caterpillar bright reflection. Anchored by spoons, tea bags soiled the water to the murk of pond silt flicked up by a trout. They fished out the tea bags and deposited them on the bank of the bowl. Sunlight gave over to more sunlight. Yesterday at the pond's edge, I watched you strain your arms, poles bent like a rain heavy stone crop. When you reeled, you used the same motion as my mother stirring heated milk into tea. The trout fought hard before surrendering to the warmer flesh of my palms and must have broken the water in a similar startle as peep sprouts rupturing through soil. We lay the fish on the bank and I split its belly, later splitting pea pods, boiling them both with a handful of tea bags, eating this meal my father shared with me for a few days with you. Where observed, sunflowers, grapefruit pulp, intermediates, a row of stalks laid out like railings, florets, reference of, with your long red thumbnail, you puncture a grapefruit and unshell like strips of thick paper, its peelings. The pulp, padded like the body of a caterpillar, spouts down your wrist a silken thread of juice. A tea kettle songbirds, the sound of a train riding the acid railings of midnight, always at midnight when our thoughts first unfloor it to dream. We carry the tea and grapefruit outside. The sky is rung gray in wind. The pines are tattered scarecrows on the horizon. The houses light up, sudden as lily pads crushed by a man wading in after a trout. We root our hands in soil cold as a tea bag left in an empty cup. Past where the clovers quilt, our horse is eating oats in the barn, his breath rising to the plume of florets the train arrives with for us always and always at midnight. This next uh, poem I'm gonna read is a serial poem. So it has a, an overarching title and each sort of embedded poem in the series also have their own titles. I'm just gonna read a couple of this one. Um, this is Field Guide to the Southeastern Idaho Phosphate District. And the first one is an introduction to the cycle. The southeastern corner of Idaho, just east of Soda Springs, a woman reminded me of someone I met once in the wood smoke of the patio on my uncle's property the last summer before he went to prison. Things turn sometimes and you end up in a place you surely thought someone would be, just not yourself. Or that person is you, though you are no longer who you trained yourself to live with and hardly recognize the expressions in the mirror. The way her gaze, your gaze, I admit, it was always you, attenuated outwards toward the junipers, though I could tell as you fringed the hem of your sundress that you were inside yourself, investigating, running over and over like a water wheel, like infinity, like time, whatever it was that nourished you, a feeding. We do this to ourselves, this erudition. Years later, calmly whispering into the receiver became the same as shouting at you, heart full of wood smoke across that field. It was a sort of loss, as if I were only remembering a conversation we'd had and needed to search it out as you'd searched out whatever it was you had to find before it, right as decay, a reckoning, found you. Structural Setting of Bird and Phosphor. Most field guides illustrate the events influencing a landscape, but how can we relay what needs said without sounding like we'd scavenged the husk of a roadside whitetail? Do you believe, as Freud did, that we are self-destructive, acid-lined and rooted deeply beneath what we consciously perceive? To frame it this way, the senses are an illusion. We want to fuck our mothers not because they are so, but because sex is a sort of death and how dare they create and get away with it. Or like Skinner, do we only seek out whatever gives us pleasure, a species of hedonists? 
no morals other than dopamine. Aren't they the same? The times you begged me, and it was a begging, to pin your wrist to the mattress, to overrule your breath with the sound of gravel. I am not who you think I am, and so I hurt you. You are not who I think you are, and so you hurt me. Like a dog salivating at the sound of a bell, I realized that when you bruised my most tender of organs, you saw me, hairy chest and stench of dick, as I saw myself, and I was happy. We called this a history of intimacy and thought about it as we drove by the phosphate mines. Men emerged from earth wheezing because the air was too bright. They were not used to being treated this way and drove home to their families who glowed so white that the men had to shield their eyes, sons with clean fingernails, daughters tragic enough to date boys who wanted to be minors, wives who hated hearing canaries sing because it sounded too much like their own names. Um, so this last poem I'm gonna read is also a serial poem. Uh, it's called Experiments in the Field of Light and I'm gonna read um, three sections from it. Song Unending. Moonlight opens on floral sheets where your body should be. Smells of wet wood, sleep sweat, the dust of curtains. I step onto the porch where it is midnight or sometime after. Sky mildews, skin is sticky and cooling. Something I cannot see, maybe you, is making noises, a scrapping sound, a rummage. I point the flashlight into the fog. Its light burrs successively on every molecule until, in a flutter, your silhouette, a woman pretty enough to make the birds shut up, flickers towards me. Every moment is light particle by light particle reborn. Participants of light and shadow. I listen as you exhale into the whine of the ceiling fan. Around us, the house is dark and slow. I rise, air snaps my skin. A tire fire controls the horizon, colored as tin sheeting left to rust in rain light. I feel another man orbiting me, a flickering white phosphor of a man, a projection of myself, strained and semi-transparent. I watch the man sit up in bed. He leans over where your face is exposed to the ceiling. He draws the covers back over your shoulders. You startle and breathe into the dust lamp. When you turn over, the man rises and walks towards me. I feel a steel ball of light thud on my lungs. We step to the sill and look out to where the tire fire has begun to smolder. Orion scratches, stuttering out of view. As I return to bed, the man wavers in and out of me. A whirl of dust connects with a wooden blade above us. Light withdrawals. Because my side of the sheet has lost light's warmth. I scoop close, press my stomach to your spine. We share what makes us visible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse. What a, what a great uh, opening from your book. I appreciate you sharing it with all of us out here in Radio Land. That's a, that's a lovely thing, a lovely thing to behold. Um, Emily, are there any questions in the YouTube uh, site for the for the readers you know there aren't but there are a lot of people saying how beautiful the poetry was and how wonderful it is and a lot of clapping emojis so thank you all so much so much for being here tonight it was so wonderful peter jesse and jason we're just very glad that you joined us thank you so much yeah what a great night thank you all i'll be in touch Appreciate yeah it. all right Thank you, Sean, and we'll see everyone next week for our next night of Poetry Month. Yeah. Bye. Yeah, ciao. Bye.